So there was a point in time in my life where I realized the world wasn't as it should be. And then I also realized that me, myself, I wasn't as I should be. I wasn't as I could be. And I realized that there was something wrong with the world and that there was something wrong with me. And I grew up in a Christian home, and you would think that me growing up in a Christian home, I should have it all figured out. I went to a Christian school my whole entire, from three years old until I graduated high school. You would think, Brad, you had it all figured out. You had all the answers. You knew exactly what God wanted you to do. But here's the reality. I didn't want anything to do with it. If you were to ask me, do you believe God is real? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is who he says he is? Yes. But did it affect my heart and my life? No. And then at 17 years old, my dad dropped unexpectedly, went into the hospital. And I remember praying in the hospital, God, if you loved us, you would heal him. God, heal him, bring him back. And then he died. And in that moment, I knew there's something wrong with the world. And in my mind, there's something wrong with God. And I remember telling God, if this is how you love us, then I'm going to run from you as far as I can. If you thought I was running from you, you haven't seen nothing yet. And I ran. And God allowed me to run. God allowed me to shake my fist at him in anger. And I did whatever my earthly desires wanted me to do. Began smoking, began smoking weed, began hanging out with a friend who had just gotten out of jail. He did time for dealing drugs, and he took me to a motel room with another friend, and he was dealing crack in the motel. And I'm thinking at the time, probably shouldn't be here, but in my mind, I don't care. And I did whatever I wanted to do. But the problem of giving in to everything that I wanted to do and chasing my own desires it led me to this place where there were days that I would, tell, I would tell God, God, I'm done. Just take my life. I'm over it. Just, just take me now. Get me out of here. Get me out of the misery. Get me out of the pain. Just, just take it. God, it would be easier if you just sucked the life out of me. You see, I was brought to a place where everything I did for my own desires didn't bring hope. It didn't bring joy. It didn't bring the longing and identity that I was looking for. In fact, it brought the opposite. It brought more loneliness and it brought more misery. And I did not know who in the world I was. And my mind would always go to this thought. There has to be something better than this. There has to be something out there that is greater, that is more loving, that is more purposeful. And so this morning, I thought that I would quote to you a great theologian, Steve Winwood, and his song was later covered by Whitney Houston. And his lyrics accurately describe my mindset, and maybe it might perhaps describe your mindset at some point in your life. They'll be up on the screen for you. Here it goes. Think about it. There must be higher love. Down in the heart or hidden in the stars above. Without it, life is wasted time. Look inside your heart. I'll look inside mine. Worlds are turning and we're just hanging on. Facing our fear and standing out there alone. A yearning and it's real to me. There must be someone who's feeling for me. Things look so bad everywhere. In this whole world, what is fair? We walk blind and we try to see, falling behind, and what could be? And then, these words. That there has to be something. There has to be a higher love. Because the way this world operates, the way I operate, it's broken. And this desire and the lyrics that he penned bring me a higher love. That can truly bring joy. 
that can truly bring life into this world where I'm broken, you're broken, the world's broken, and creation is broken. And this morning, we are going to unpack, we are going to see that there is a higher love that broke in our lives when we were broken. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look, unpack verses 1 through 10. And if you have your outline with you, it's also in the church app. If you have it there, you can type your notes in our church app. And so here's the main thing I want us to focus on this morning. If you don't remember anything else that I say today or anything else, just rest in this truth today. I wrote it in my notes this way. His grace is enough. His grace is enough. And I'm talking about God's grace is enough. And so I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. They'll be on the screen for you so you can follow along. And this is the Apostle Paul talking. And he said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the, path, the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, or like the rest of humanity. And as we come to this text, we have to keep this in mind, that the book of Ephesians, Paul is talking to Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And the book of Ephesians is all about how can we be united together? How can people from all tongues and tribes and nations, how can we truly love one another? How can we live in a place where we go from judging each other to loving each other? How can we coexist when we're so different? And Paul is telling us it's the faith in Christ that unites us. And so as we unpack this, keep this in mind. How do we, as broken people, fellowship with one another? How do we love one another? And how can we impact our world with one another? And so we keep that in mind. And so as we come to this passage, Paul wants us to understand a basic truth about all of humanity. He wants Jewish believers to understand this, and he wants the Gentile nations to understand this. All of us are dead in our trespasses and sins. You might say, Brad, that's so gloom and doom. It's not gloom and doom. Is it the reality? Yeah. There's all things in us. We're faulty people. And you can say, well, I'm a good person. You might do good things, but at your core, you know you have evil desires. You know you have sinful passions. You know you have sinful lust. And you can sit back and you can tell us, oh, I'm good. There's nothing wrong. No, you know something is broken inside of you. Something's not right. And this is what Paul wants us to understand. No matter who you are, all of humanity is dead in their trespasses. But this is bigger than just me sitting back going, Okay, here's the sins that I did wrong today. And it's different than me pointing out the sins that you did wrong this week. It's bigger than that. It's more than just your personal sins. There's a bigger magnitude of what is happening here. And Paul uses two very different words, opposite words, that are intentional, that he wants us to pay attention to. He says, we were dead in our sins. And then in a few verses, in a moment we're going to unpack, he says, and that you were made alive. Two opposite words, dead and alive. And Paul uses them on purpose. Why? Because these words refer to Exodus. You guys remember the Exodus story of, of, of Israel, where they were in the land of the Egyptians, and God set them free, and he brought them through the Red Sea, the water, and he brought them from a place of death to a place of life? This is what Paul wants us to keep in mind. And what Paul means by death it's not just this physical death where we're going to die one day, which we all do. Death is the idea of exile. Exile meaning we were cast out of the land where God's presence dwells. And so anytime somebody is dead in Scripture and exiled, they're considered spiritually dead. Because they've been cast out of God's presence into the wilderness, into a land where they are on their own. But to be made alive, to come back from the land of the dead, takes resurrection and a return to where God lives, where God dwells, where God dwells, where once again we become the people of God. 
And so Paul wants us to see this idea of being dead in your sins is just bigger than your personal sins. It's bigger than you pointing out the sins of your neighbor. This is something that has affected all of humanity. And being dead in sin affects everyone, every person, not just the people that mistreat you or the rude neighbor that lives next door to you. It includes ourselves. We're all broken. We've all been exiled. And I want you to look at me at Genesis chapter 3 because Paul didn't get this out of nowhere. This goes back to the beginning of Scripture. Verse 22 says this, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God did what? Send him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What is Paul getting? What is the writer of Genesis getting at? He wants us to see that what happened in Adam, when Adam and Eve sinned, the serpent tempted Adam and Eve. He said, If you were to really eat this fruit, or did that really say you were going to die? And when Adam ate the fruit, did he die? Yes and no. Did he die physically in that moment? No, but he died spiritually. And how did he die spiritually? God said, I have to get you out of my presence. You're going to exile. When you look in scripture, when someone is sent to the east, they're out in exile. But in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection, he performed the greatest exodus to bring people from death to life that the world had ever seen. And for us to get out of this place of death, it takes a resurrection. And so we have the story of Adam, and Paul is going back to this idea of death and resurrection because he wants us to see, when we read Genesis, the Jewish people were to see themselves in Adam and to realize the story of Adam is the story of Israel. And when we read Genesis and see when Adam disobeyed, the story of Adam, it's not, oh, Adam, how could you do that? The idea is, man, I'm Adam. I did that too. I'm broken, just like Adam and Eve. Their story is my story. And if they were exiled, I've been exiled. So how do I get back? And so Paul brings this up because he wants Jewish believers to know, yes, you were the people and you had the promises of God. But you were broken. And Gentiles, yes, I know God's salvation has come to you. And I know that they gave to Israel first, but now you got to be. You're not more special than Israel. Because you're broken too. And for us in the churches, we have to become a place where we realize we are not more special than anybody else in this room. We're all faulty. We're all broken. Every one of us. And we're all in need of the same saving grace. There is no one on this earth that can claim they are truly good. All of humanity has been affected by their sin. And then look at how Paul describes this. In those verses, here's what he says about us when we were in exile, when we were dead in our sins. He says, we were slaves to the way of this world. We obeyed the spirit of the air, meaning we obeyed the Satan and his demonic influences. We lived out the, the passions of our flesh. We carried out the desires of the body and the mind. And why does Paul mention the body and the mind? Because he wants you to see you're wholly affected by sin. Everything you do is broken apart from Jesus Christ. Our whole body is dead. Now examine your life. Was there ever a time where these characteristics defined your life? Where you're like, man, I did some of those things. Yep, I filled out the flesh. And there are still people today that are falling under the, the ways of this world, that are following the things of, that the Satan wants us to keep in mind. And so there's things like this that is happening. People say, there is no God. People will say, life is all about how you make it. Or, you don't need to be married. Or, you know what, just, just make your own identity. You get to decide who you are and how people view you. It's your body, do whatever you want. With it. Nobody has the right to tell you what to do. Believing in God, I'm sorry, but that's just a crutch to get you through life. 
Eat, drink, and be merry, because that's all there is to life. And then for some of us as believers, here's what the enemy whispers into our ears. Your brokenness is the worst that God has ever seen. You are too far gone for God to love you. You will never overcome your addiction. You have blown it one too many times, and because you've blown it a second time, I'm giving up on you. And these are the truths that the world puts into our ears, puts into our minds, and if we embrace it and we walk in them, it will destroy us. It will keep us in a place of depression, it will keep us in a place of misery, and so Paul has to remind them, this is what you were, this is how everybody in the world has been, but God's not going to leave us there, amen? Because if there's exile, there's a return from exile. If there's death, there is life when it comes to the things of God. And so because we were in exile, we need a return. And just as God planned a way for Israel to come out of exile, He's done the same thing for us through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And so today, that resurrection does come from a higher love. It comes from God Himself. Because His grace is enough. Look at me in verse 4 of this chapter. Two beautiful words that start this off. But God. Rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which He loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Paul wants us to understand this truth. The way we come out of exile has to take an act of God. It has to take a work of God. And God can only bring us from death to life by his grace. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we can do to make it come into our life. We can't get it ourselves. It takes the act of God and His grace to bring you through resurrection. And this is why Paul says that when you were dead in your sin, God made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And this idea is something that Paul gets right from Jesus himself. How many of you have heard of the prodigal son in scriptures? Well, if you haven't heard of it, I would encourage you to look up Luke 15. I'm going to briefly give you the idea. A son tells his father, I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait for you to die, Dad. I want you to give it to me now. I'm ready to go live my life. So his dad gives him the inheritance. The son goes out and blows it on every worldly passion, everything he wants to do, and ends up in a place he gets completely rock bottom. He's now living in a pig pen where he's eating the same thing the pigs eat after the pigs have eaten. And he gets to a place where he's messy, he's broken, he's given into every sin that he has ever wanted to get into. And he has this thought, you know what? I think it would be better for me if I just go back to my father's house. I'll just be a servant in his house. And so he returns home. And Jesus tells a story as he's returning home. The father is out waiting for the son's arrival. And when the son returns to his home, the father runs out to meet his son. And look at what it says. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was what? Dead. And is what? Alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And you see, this is what Paul wants us to keep in mind. Through faith in Jesus Christ, God brings us from death to life where we have been saved by grace. But why did God do this? Why does God treat us this way. How can God in our brokenness, when we've all shook our fist in the face of God and said, I'm living my life my way, and He responds to us with grace? 
Paul says it's because of his great love for us. It is his great, his magnificent love. Where when he gives us his grace, his grace is enough. And I love verse 4 that we just read. Because I think it's the power of where all of us are and where all of us have been. Because sometimes it's hard for us to come and approach God because we know the brokenness that we wrestle with. And there are times we avoid God, where we don't come to God because we are afraid of how he's going to treat us. And in the midst, this is why Paul says, look, this is, I'm going to describe it out. All of you have been broken. But here's what I want you to catch. Verse 4. But God. In the midst of your brokenness, but God shows up in your life. God doesn't leave you stranded. God doesn't leave you alone. God doesn't look at you and say, you're stuck in your idols. I don't care. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter if your marriage is broken. It doesn't matter if you're still wrestling with addiction. It doesn't matter if you looked at pornography last week. It doesn't matter if you say, look, I emotionally, I verbally, I physically abused my spouse. It doesn't matter what you did last night. God shows up in your brokenness because it is the love and the grace of God that says, I'm not leaving you there in your death. I am going to bring you to life because I love you. See, there's times that I think part of the reason why we wrestle in our brokenness and don't go open and honest with God is because we have a faulty view of the God who approaches us. And I've heard many people describe it where if I go to God, God's an angry God. God is going to come at me with a lightning bolt ready to strike me dead. God is going to come and is just going to judge me. God's going to come down with an iron fist. And so we, we, we back away. But I'm going to just highlight for you what Paul has described here about this God who approaches me and who approached me and the God who approaches you. And he describes God completely different. He says, but God, he is rich in mercy. The scriptures say his mercies are new every morning says he has great love. The idea of great is many, many, much, outrageous, ridiculous, lugubrious, whatever words you want to add. It's this idea of unconditional love that your mind can't even grasp. This is the love that he has for you. And then he says, out of that love for you, he is willing to show in the coming ages his immeasurable riches. Things we can't even begin to understand. And because of his love for you, he has made you alive. And by his grace, you've been saved and I've been saved. And guess what? His grace is enough. And Paul goes on and he says, look, his grace is so much enough that he has seated us in the heavenly realms with Jesus. You might say, what does that mean? What does it mean? In the heavenly realms. Well, when Christ accomplished the work that God had given to him, and God seated him in the heavenly realms at his right hand, Jesus is in a position of authority and ruling in the world. And for us to be put underneath Jesus, right underneath him, we have the same authority and mission that Jesus had. What did Jesus come here to the earth to do? Did he come to have a good time? Did he come to just do things for himself? He came to seek and save the lost. And us seated in the heavenly realms, that means we've got things to do. Our mission is Jesus' mission. You've been saved by grace to seek and save the lost. Not saved by grace to sit and hear about the lost, right? It's we've been saved for good works that God has given us to do. And Paul mentions this. You've been seated, seated in the heavenly realms so you can do what Christ did and be his hands and feet in this lost and broken world. And his grace is enough for your daily life. I talk to many people, many believers, who they wrestle with their own sinfulness still. There's this broken life they still go back with. And they wrestle with, I think I need more of this. I need more of this, Brad. I need, I need more of this. Because if I had more of this, 
then I would be able to, to do things that God has called me to do. If I just added more of this, if I just added more Bible reading, if I just added more prayer, if I just added more to my Christian life, then God would show up and do a work. No. His grace is enough. Paul says he has given you everything you need to live a godly life. You are not lacking in God's grace. You have been saved by His grace. His grace will sustain you. And His, His grace will continue to bring you to the destination He's called you to do. You're not lacking in grace. What we're lacking is faith in this great and faithful God. You have everything that you need. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you have it all. Because His grace is enough. His grace is sufficient for you. And why does He do that? Because He loves us. He loves you. Right now. Who you are. Where you are. He loves you. Look at me at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. Paul wants us to understand completely and 100%. That God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. None of us can earn our salvation. Because here's why. If you're like me. If I can earn my own salvation. The moment I earn it. I'm judging you. How dare you not be on my level. How dare you. No, I'm not going to help you. You need to help yourself. God knew the kind of people we would become. We would become prideful and judging. Now, church, if we're honest, that happens now when we're all broken. So imagine if we could attain perfection on our own, the magnitude and the extreme that we would judge other people and not make them feel God's love in His house. We would abuse that. But God also knew we were completely incapable of doing anything good for ourselves. Pastor Brian said it great last week. The best we could do is filthy rags, which means the best you can do is nothing for your salvation. You are dead. Have you ever seen a dead person do anything? You ever said, hey, can you go to the store and buy me groceries? That person ain't doing nothing. You can tell them all day long. This is what God wants to understand. You were dead, incapable, unable. It takes a miracle and an act of God to bring you alive because he wants us to understand this. We're all in the same boat. We're all in desperate need of God's grace. And everybody that comes into this house of God should be welcomed and loved because we're all the same. We come from different countries and nations and tribes and tongues, and that's awesome. That's beauty. That's amazing to see that there's so many different people, and we can all get along together because we all understand we're united in our faith in Christ, and we're all broken, and we love each other, and we're here to encourage one another. This is what Paul wants us to understand. You've been brought from death to life, and look at the love that you guys can tell and show to one another. So don't think of yourself better than you ought. We're all in the same scenario, in desperate need of God's grace. And then Paul says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And created new is all about resurrection. It's all about bringing from death to life. Paul said it this way, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old things that passed away all have become new. And God has works for you to do. And you can read the rest of Ephesians to see what those works look like. But the idea of workmanship, I love this. As I was studying the idea of this word, uh, the word workmanship could literally be a piece of art, an artwork. It could be a sculpture that God has created. And one New Testament scholar said it this way, that it could be, think of like a musical score, where God has taken your story, and when you place your faith in Christ and His grace saves you, that He is writing this beautiful symphony with your life. Think about that. Because just like a musical song goes, I'm not musically, so if I butcher the terms, just forgive me, but a musical song, it builds up, there's tension, there's melodies, there's all these things, it builds up to this climax, and then it slows down to whatever that after climax thing is called. And it moves, and music moves you all throughout. And this is what Paul wants to understand. You're God's masterpiece. And he's writing a song with your life. And you know what, there's gonna be times in your song where you go back to your old life 
where you say, you know what, I'm going to go back to that old road. It's like, I'm going to take my horse to the old town road, ride to the And here's what happened to me as a Christian 10 years ago. I decided, I'm going to go back to these things of the world. And I give in to those things of the world. But this is the good grace of God. You can go back to that old way, but he won't keep you there. You might say, well, I've been in it for a long time, Brad. He's going to nudge you and encourage you because there was a place in time when I poured into whatever I wanted to do and God spoke the words. Remember, Brad, this is not who you are. It's time to go back to the life I've called you to. And so the grace of God, even when you walk away to the other road, the grace of God will nudge you back to where he wants you to be. Because here's the reality, folks. You didn't earn God's grace. And you don't get to lose God's grace in your life. There's nothing more you could do to add more of it to your life. And there's nothing you could do to make God stop working in your life. Because here's the beauty. Rest of the truth today. Your salvation, what God is doing in you, is not dependent upon you. It depends on the faithfulness of God. He who, God, began the good work in you, doesn't say we are faithful to complete it. Never that. It says he who began the good work in you is faithful to complete it. And God has kept every promise he's ever made. And if he says, by grace you have been saved, and I created you for good works, guess what you're going to accomplish? The good works that God has given you. Because His grace is moving you and making it happen in your life. So here's what we have to remember when we're broken. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love for us, God will not give up on you. He's writing your song. And He will complete your song. He will push you and challenge you and encourage you to live out those good works. And it never depends on your effort. It depends upon His grace. And His grace is enough. I'm going to close with a story this morning. And there's a guy named Tommy. And he's a, he's a co-author of a Christian book. And there was a girl who was adopted by a family. And for whatever reason, whenever they would go to Disney World, they would never bring her. They would leave her behind. And their family would go on the trip to Disney World. Now, in the little girl's mind, the reason why she didn't get to go to Disney World is because she behaved bad. And so when Tommy adopted this little eight-year-old girl, she told him all about the things about this family going to Disney World that she never had the opportunity to go. And so he said, you know what, the next time we go to the East Coast, he tells her, we're going to Disney World as a family. You're coming with us. We're going to make this happen. So he said about a month before they're supposed to go on the trip, she started acting so naughty. She stole a snack when she could have just asked for one. She lied when she could have just told the truth. She was saying wicked things to her siblings, doing everything bad. And he said that as the days got closer, it just kept multiplying and multiplying. She was just acting so terrible. And so one day, he sits her on his lap. What's going on? And she says these words, I know what you're going to do. You're not taking it. Disney World, are And he said in a moment, he thought, hey, you know what, I could use this to my advantage. I could tell her right now, you know what, unless you act better, we're not going to Disney World. But he said God told him he needed to have grace in that moment. And so instead, he asked her, he said, is this trip something that we are doing as a family? And he said that she nodded through tears in her eyes and said, yes. And he asked her, are you a part of this family? And she said, yes. And he goes, and here's what we're doing. We're going to Disney World. Now, there's consequences for all the bad behavior you have. But because this is something the family's doing, you're going to Disney World. And so he says they get to Disney World. It's hot. There's long lines. There's all the craziness that goes with that. In between her being rebellious. And then he said they got into the tell him at the end of the day, and his daughter was completely transformed. He held her, he prayed with her, 
And then he asked her, he said, so how was your first time at Disney World? And he said that she laid her head on the stuffed unicorn, closed her eyes for a second, and then opened them ever so slightly and said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I'm good. It's because I'm yours. You see, this is the grace of God in our life. Father, it's not because I'm good. It's because I'm yours. And your Father in heaven tells you, you're going to Disney World. Not really. <laughs> but you're going to see the immeasurable riches of his grace in the age to come. And we're going to sit back and be blown away. And our mindset's going to be, Father, I get to see this and be a part of it. But it's not because I'm good. It's because I'm good. Yeah. And so rest of this back to Rest of this back to that none of us in here are perfect. Even after placing our faith in Christ. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. But Paul had even had a moment in his life that God had to tell him, my grace is sufficient for you. And it's sufficient for all of us. And so today I want to challenge you. You might have been in a place where, hey, I, I don't, I've kind of been wrestling with God because of my brokenness. Understand we're all broken. And in just a moment, the worship team is going to come out and lead us in the worship song. I just want to tell you, like, we have the altars here, and our deacons and elders are going to be at the front, our leaders, to talk to you. And so many times I think we're ashamed of the altar. It's like, if I go to the altar, someone's going to know I'm broken. So let me just break the ice. We're all broken. We all need to be at the altar. Okay? We all need to be at the altar. Now, I'm not saying that because I want to see an altar full. What I'm trying to tell you is this altar is here. Because all of us are broken. And if there's something that God is wrestling with in your heart. And say, man, I need to go to the altar. And I need to confess. Or I need to just rest in God's grace. This altar is open. Not for embarrassment. Not for judging. The people in this church are not going to be like, oh, I'm going to write down the names of everybody. No. We are there to pray for each other. Because we all have this understanding. And for others of us. Today, I'm going to sit back and say, well, I don't even know how to, what, I don't even know how to become part of God's family. How do I even receive this grace? And here's what the scriptures say, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and God raised him from the dead, you will put your faith in Christ, and God's grace will come into your heart, your life. And so if that's you today, it's you coming down and just praying and saying, God, I believe Jesus is Lord. Have mercy on me. I've blown it. I'm a sinner. And when we cry out to God in faith, He responds with grace. And that grace is enough for you. And so I'm going to pray with you and the worship team is going to come down and you do what God has called you to do. Father God in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace. Father, we thank you that when you looked at us in the midst of our brokenness and our sin, that you didn't cast us aside, you didn't throw us away, but it was your great love that came down and broke into our lives and showed us that we are your children. We are loved by our Father in heaven. We have an identity. We have purpose. And you have made us new. And the idols and the sins you have broken them in our life and set us free to love you and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, thank you. We love you. It's in your name we